Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the celebration of the astonishing life of Rachel Rockwell, actor, choreographer, director, friend, daughter, sister, wife, and mother. As an exceptional storyteller whose vision sought to bring out the best in all of us, from designers to technicians to actors, Rachel had a particular magic, special magic, when it came to young performers. That was an assortment of individuals whose lives were forever changed, having experienced the wonder that was Rachel. That was Mike Tutai's montage expert excerpts from her work that stands as a testament to her creativity. And it was Roberta Ducek that arranged the uh, choir and directed it. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And this is my friend, Bill Ositek. I'm honored to be here tonight to celebrate the life of our dear friend, Rachel. I've been friends with Rachel since the early 90s. We were first cast together in Mark Robbins' The Little Mermaid. I played Melody. Oh, that was, that was The Little Mermaid's name. And, um, and she, in case you, yeah, it's the Mark Robin version, right? Yeah. Already the laughter begins. That's good, right? That's good. good. Yeah, Disney, Disney would have sued us. So, um, uh, well, Rachel played my mother. She played Flutter, the butterfly. Naturally. Pi yeah, pivotal role, yes. And um, <laughs> we did a lot of shows together. We did And the World Goes Round at the Marriott. We did Taffetas. We did, um, I can name them all, but I won't bore you. Uh, we traveled together on the road in Hal Prince's showboat. And then we went on to collaborate as uh, director and musical director. And uh, we had so much fun working together. I taught her how to roller skate. Well, sort of. She wasn't the best roller skater, but... Uh, <laughs> And she taught me how to play violin in 10 minutes in a stairwell before my first understudy rehearsal. Um, I marveled at her ability to plan the perfect gourmet meal, and she marveled at my ability to create a four, um, I, I can't talk anymore, um, four ingredient casserole. There we go. <laughs> she was more than a friend, she was my sister. She was always a mother to everyone, but I was her big sister. I asked for the double wide podium, but I guess they just couldn't swing that. <laughs> I met Rachel Rockwell when I was stage managing Pinocchio, a Mark Robin kids show. <laughs> Apparently Mark Robin is the galvanizing influence <laughs> and force on Chicago theater. I was stage managing Pinocchio and Rachel was choreographing it. Despite the fact that she was eight months pregnant with Jake, she danced everything full out. I was going to be directing King and I here and I thought that's the choreographer that I want and I asked Rachel if she would choreograph it with me, for me. We were friends for two years before we realized, both realized that we lived five houses apart. <laughs> Your turn. Oh, great. <laughs> Remember when we didn't need glasses? Remember that? No. All right. Well, tonight we're going to be sharing a lot of stories about Rachel and how she touched all of our lives. Please welcome Garth Helm, Rachel's husband, and Jake Helm, Rachel's son. <laughs> Hello. Good evening. I'm going to just put on my reading glasses. I can't believe you actually did that. So pink works for you, but not me. Nope. I love you, but no. I tried. Hey. Thank you to everyone here in TV land. Um, heartfelt thank you to everyone involved in this amazing evening. 
everyone, uh, including Bill and Roberta, for putting it on, and Guile for uh, hosting, and all the speakers this evening. Um, you're in for a treat, and uh, thank you all for being here. That's all I have to say. Jake Helm. Hi there, everybody. Uh, I just want to say a couple quick words about my mom and how wonderful she is. Um, when I think of my mom, I think of sitting in the back of the rehearsal room with her and watching her helm, that's ironic, uh, <laughs> all of these incredible shows and just watching her create her creations, I guess. Um, and I also think of being with her personally as my mom. I mean, Rachel Rockwell and my mom are two very different individuals, but also really close together in a lot of different ways, because especially with a lot of the children, for example, the wonderful children who just did that choir, which was amazing. Uh, not so young anymore. Yeah, that was weird to see them all not young, because I, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Like, what happened here? It, it, was, it was strange and not quite what I was used to. But, you know, oh. I hope there's the next generation. There's the next generation right there. Um, but, yeah, my mom and Rachel Rockwell were definitely two different individuals, but they were also the same in a lot of ways. She was always such a mother with all of the different children that she's worked with over the past forever. And she's always been there for them and me. And for a second, I want to talk about working with her as an actor in her shows that she's directed. That was interesting. Um, it was a ride. Uh, she would make sure I got the parts right because she had so much extra time to make sure I got it right. <laughs> And I don't know if I wanted that extra time, but it was there. So she would always uh, make sure that I had all of my lines down and all of my blocking down. She would make me audition for her own audition. She would set up my audition to go audition for her. <laughs> and... Cheat in the system a little bit? Maybe, don't know. But I remember I was like, I would never have done that, but it's way better than what I would have done. So thanks. Uh, yeah, but she, it was always a pleasure to be in, an actor in the shows that she worked on. For example, uh, Mary Poppins and Oliver, which was my first show. I remember thinking, I had just gotten a Hot Wheels car from Toys R Us, and I was in the back seat of the car, and I said, hey mom, you know what, I think I want to try out for Oliver. And she was like, oh, that's great. Okay, cool. And it kind of kick-started from there. So that, that was the beginning of, of, of that. Uh, <laughs> that whole jolly ride. But yeah, that, that was what it was like to work with Rachel Rockwell in that sense. But on a personal level, as my mom, she was always there for me. And she was always understanding my problems, if I ever had any, because she was like, I lived it, honey. I, I've been there. I done that. I got the t-shirt. Um, <laughs> She's always been able to understand me and get me, and that is something I can never repair for. Um, I want to give a couple quick thanks to some of the people who are here, um, especially Matthew and Zachary Zarga. They've been there for me through this entire journey, and I don't know where I'd be without them. I, I really appreciate that. Um, and also all of the, the families and all of the people who have reached out to me over the past month or so and said, hey, are you okay? And checking in on me and making sure everything is good. 
it means more than you know. And it's just really incredible that you could all could do that. I mean, it's, it's changed my life, and I really appreciate it. Here, hold that for a second. Thanks. <laughs> Wow, this is fancy. I didn't even... Yeah, I know. Yeah. It's a fancy day. It's a fancy day, isn't it? Yeah. Special shout out to Team Canada. Who oh, came yeah. Down. Yeah. Yeah, all right, wow. And to, to finish it off, again, please, everyone that contributed to GoFundMe. Seriously, I mean... It's an amazing gift that we won't forget. You want to borrow this? Could I? Yeah. <laughs> and we will pay it forward. And you'll find that out tonight. Thanks very much.
That was Ariana Burke singing Feeling Small from Wonderland, an original rock musical that Rachel developed with Michael Mahler for Chicago Children's Theater. Please help me welcome Nick Dantes, Ava Morse, and Matthew Uzaraga, just a few of the young performers whose lives were forever changed by Rachel. I think it's safe to say that Rachel Rockwell touched all of our lives in a profound way. And for me, that's an understatement. When I first auditioned for Rachel, I only dreamt of actually being cast. My interests weren't the same as most middle school boys, and I never really felt like I actually fit in with everyone else because my passion for dancing, singing, and acting weren't the same as my peers. And because of this, I began taking dance classes late and pretty much came into the audition without much to offer. Everything I lacked in experience, Rachel made up for in knowing how to create, teach, encourage, and empower. I remember being so afraid to perform in front of the cast during rehearsals because I felt so inadequate. Every day, Rachel showed me kindness and support until I began to believe in myself. I'll never forget half hour on opening, she came and pulled me aside to the back stairs, held my face in her hands, looked me in the eyes, and told me how proud she was of me. When I stepped on that stage that night, everything in me wanted to make her proud, and I felt confident because of her. I am forever grateful to her for having taken a chance on a 13-year-old boy whose only passion was to perform on stage. There is no greater gift you can give someone than confidence and the love that she gave us all every day. My life is forever changed because of you, Rachel. Thank you will never be enough. I have been very blessed to do many shows with the amazing Rachel Rockwell. She directed my very first professional show, Annie, at the Paramount Theater in Aurora in 2012. At the time, I was six years old, and I was the youngest in the cast. I was overwhelmed by all the older kids and adults, and that caused me to be very shy in front of the cast. During rehearsal, Rachel noticed that I was very nervous. She then offered to let me sit in her lap. <laughs> she would help me with my lines and getting to know the cast. She helped build up my confidence. She made me the confident actress I am today. Without her guidance, I would not be where I am today. As I grew older, I had the honor of working with her more. And she would remind me of that every time I felt nervous and when I worked with her. I'm very blessed to have this wonderful memory with her. From age 10 onward, Rachel was a constant for me. Aside from my mom, she was the biggest female influence and presence in my life. I had the pleasure of working with her every year, during which she helped me grow into the performer I am today. She always believed in me, and because of that, she helped me believe in myself. My dance ability grew under her wing, and I can honestly attribute my love for dance to Rachel and her ingenious choreography. I remember several instances in which she would show us some choreography, we tried out on stage, and if it didn't work, she'd already have a plan B. <laughs> this meticulous preparation was a huge impact on my own worth ethic. It came to the point where I thought that's just how prepared people were supposed to be. <laughs> But, but, I must say that the biggest gift she ever gave me was my friendship with Jake. I would have never met my best friends without her. So I had the unique opportunity of seeing her at work and at home through Skyping with Jake. Seeing her face or hearing her voice on my laptop would always brighten my day. She may not have known it, but in many ways, I considered her family because I saw and heard from her more than my actual extended family. <laughs> she was a constant, and she always will be because I'll always see her influence in the work of my theater family and in Jake. Now please welcome to the stage Gary Heidi, Rachel Rockwell's father.
Thanks, I actually have notes. I may need them. <clears throat> so I'm here to do a little background on the pre-Rachel Rockwell um, <laughs> that probably none of you got to know except uh, her close family. So she was born in Columbia, Missouri, and I was, uh, had just finished my sophomore year. Glory already had a master's degree. She's almost a little older than me. And <laughs> she was teaching in Mexico, Missouri, and driving 40 miles each way. Uh, and somehow I got hired to direct the high school musical, My Fair Lady, and Glory was pregnant, and Rachel was exposed to My Fair Lady and Broadway music uh, through the entire birth process. Glory was seven months pregnant when she was directing the orchestra. So Rachel came out uh, singing all of those tunes. She, oh, she became Natalie because Glory loved Natalie Wood, and I had just seen a movie uh, with Joanne Woodward called Rachel, Rachel. It wasn't the film, but it was the name, and they, they went together well. Uh, we then moved to Oakland City, Indiana, where Glory was teaching, and there, hasn't, there was literally not a year of her life that we weren't doing a musical. Um, I direct, I started a community theater and uh, directed musicals. She came to rehearsals, she came to every performance. You know, she, uh, when she would get home, she would start playing the parts. There was always music playing in our house. Uh, she loved dancing. and. She was always kind of a frightened child at night, but when she would dance, you would see that inside her there was kind of a free spirit. Uh, my favorite photo, which we would now be arrested for, uh, that I printed when I worked in a newspaper office, is Rachel in a tutu standing uh, by, or actually dancing by this very tall Christmas tree, uh, nude other than the tutu, uh, you know, uh, but it's, it's a pretty incredible photo and it really shows who she was uh, when she was little. Uh, when her brother came, she acted like she was really happy, uh, <laughs> but b considering that she was loved, you know, 24-7, uh, she really wasn't all that happy. I will tell you this. Uh, I wanted to speak to her so badly when she was born that I treated her like she was a parrot and I would, I constantly had her repeating things. So she said her first words at 10 months, at 14 months, uh, she, when people would come to the house, she would bark and hiss and meow and she would say, that's onomatopoeia and then she would spell it, okay? <laughs> <clears throat> Which was really precocious but really fake. Uh, <clears throat> So when her brother was born, she would love him and kiss him and pet him. And the minute we left the room, he would start crying. <laughs> and this went on quite a few times before I finally caught on and peeked around the corner and she was pinching him. <laughs> okay. She always appeared to be an angel, but we knew that there was more to Rachel than angel. Um, <laughs> One example, which I would, if there weren't children here, I would give you the details, but I can't. Uh, Jeremy was three, he was a little cherub, you know, a little Christopher Robin. Uh, the Lutheran minister at Glory's Church had come to our house to try to convince me that I should be coming to the Lutheran Church. And Jeremy comes paddling down the steps, and he walks up, and out of his mouth comes the most vile, hideous, shocking phrase Gloria and I have ever heard, and we could not imagine where he would have come up with something so horrible. And the minister said, hi, honey, what was that you said? And he repeated it. <laughs> and lit, I'm, not a, I'm not joking, within 30 seconds, the minister was in his car driving away. Okay, we didn't know until about eight years ago when Rachel finally admitted that she was sitting at the top of the stairs and she told him to go down and say those words to the Lutheran minister. <laughs> She spent every year of her life in a theater. We, she, first it was a community theater, then Gloria and I were cast in the first off-off Broadway production of Dames at Sea near St. Louis. One of our friends is here, he was in the show. She came to all of those rehearsals. Then when we started working at Evansville Civic Theater, she would come to those rehearsals, she would come 
you know, the performances. It was, it was always music. It drove her brother into heavy metal. Uh, one of the, my fondest memories, and I posted a couple of her, my favorite Father's Day cards, was in our living room, she would dance, but if I came into the room, she would always say, Daddy, will you dance with me? And I would say yes, and so she would get on my, stand on my feet, and we would dance around the living room. So for years and years, she would look and find a, a card where the little girl was standing on her daddy's feet dancing. Uh, I'll have those forever. Uh, when she was 10, I took her to um, the Executive Inn in Evansville because Melba Moore was performing. And she loved Melba Moore. She loved, she loved Melba Moore. She loved Melba Moore's voice and hair. Some of you have never heard of Melba Moore, obviously. Uh, she won a Tony Award in Pearly. And uh, her album, I've Got Love, Rachel knew every song and would sing along. So here, I got on the elevator, and here Melba Moore steps on, and Rachel says, I love you, Melba Moore. She said, I know every lyric to hair and every lyric to your album, I've Got Love. And Melba Moore said, I would never let my child listen to that stuff. <laughs> when Rachel was 12, I took her to the executive end because she wanted to see Cheetah Rivera. And the only show we could get into was the 10 o'clock show. So here's Cheetah with her three dancer boys. You know, she's 47 or eight years old, kicking it high. And Rachel just thought it was the greatest thing ever. So I decided that we would sneak upstairs and try to see Cheetah in her room. So I took her up, and one of the boys ran out of her room wearing his little nylon briefs, and then right back into the room, and Rachel said, that's, that's it, that's Leland. She said, that's Leland. <laughs> she liked Leland. Um, so I went up and I knocked on the door and Cheetah came and Cheetah had taken off her wig. She'd taken off one of her eyelashes. She was soaked. She had on a robe. She, was, she looked like she'd been through a war. And she took Rachel into the dressing room and introduced her to all of the semi-nude dancer boys. <laughs> And, and treated her like she'd known her forever and asked her, you know, what do you want to do? Oh, I want to be a dancer like you and I want to be on stage. I mean, just a lovely, lovely woman who took some time and it made a huge impression on how you treat people in the theater. Um, when Rachel was 15, it was the very first American premiere of Biograph Girl at Evansville Civic Theater, and she played Mary Pickford. I was D.W. Griffith. Gloria was my secretary, and it was a family affair. And uh, it was a story of uh, the early silent films with Mary Pickford, Lillian Gish, um, and we found out Lillian Gish was flying from New York to see the opening of our show. So that afternoon, um, I can, does anybody remember Lillian Gish? <laughs> Good, good. <clears throat> so here comes Lillian Gish walking in, and I sw I'm not joking. It looked like she had been lit by a spot. I mean, there, the, her inner light was so strong, literally she was glowing, and I'm not exaggerating. And she immediately took to Rachel and had, or Natalie, and had Natalie come and sit by her and ask her all kinds of questions. She, she told her about what it was like to be in silent films. She told her about... Um, the pitfalls of, of, of a theatrical career and just really just kind of adopted her for a short period of time and that made a huge impression. And Rachel said, you know, th some of these stars are just like the nicest people. And she learned that some people that weren't stars were not some of the nicest people. Um, she... When she was about 12, she hit a wall in her self-esteem. And it was about then that she realized uh, her body was changing and she was not going to be the ballerina that she wanted to be. And I said, well, you know, you got my mom's bosom, so it's probably going to get you a lot of work <laughs> that has nothing to do with ballet. Uh, she wasn't very happy about that. And she came home from school one day, and she was, you know, not doing well. And I said, honey, what's wrong? And she said, dad, 
I'm just not as smart as you think I am. And I said, well, here's the thing. I said, you don't even know who you are yet, but I have kind of a glimmer. And I said, you're going to do some amazing things because you have a critical eye. You're never satisfied with anything. You'll always make it better. You'll always try to make it better. And you have an empathetic heart. Okay? So as, as you get older, you'll find out that there are things you can do that you don't even know. So let me just say this to people who have young children that are in the audience. Whatever your child's dream is, it's your job to support the dream. And that dream may change five times, but your whole job, other than getting them ready to leave you, is, is to show encouragement for whatever that child really loves. And I think it, it kind of made a difference. Um, she came to me her, after her junior year of high school and she said, I just cannot graduate from Boonville High School, Dad. Uh, also, she had gotten in trouble when she was 14 something at school and I would not let her go to some kind of a camp where she was going to learn theater. And she literally told everyone, <laughs> she, to she told everyone that she met that I had destroyed her career. <laughs> so not wanting to destroy her career any further, I said, what are you thinking? And she said, uh, I'm thinking the school for a creative, uh, Creative Performing Arts in Cincinnati. And I said, well, isn't it a high school? Yes, I said, do they have housing? Well, no, Dad, it's a high school. And I talked to Glow, and Glow said, oh, I don't know. And Rachel said, I can't, I have to go. So we took her to Cincinnati, we put her in an apartment, she was not quite 17 years old. Uh, we drove away thinking, okay, we've either destroyed her life or we've given her great hope. Uh, there she met wonderful, talented people. She came way out of herself. She was around people, like-minded people. It made a huge difference in her life. And then she was lucky enough to get a scholarship to the University of Evansville. And if you don't know that theater, uh, probably the person that's most responsible for the success of that theater is sitting in the audience, John David Lutz. Um, she found a group of people, and, th and those people have networked for 25 years. I mean, they've gone to New York, they've had success, they've been in Chicago, they've had success, they've been in films. Uh, it's, it, it's just a, it's a wonderful experience in, a small, in Evansville, Indiana, the University of Evansville, where she really came out of herself, and she got to, you know, be the lead in the musicals. She wanted to do straight plays, but, you know, Carrie Preston got all those roles and she just couldn't stand it. Uh, and I said, well, you know, Carrie's not real happy that you're the lead in the musicals either. Um, and they both done, you know, they both did really well. Uh, she was the choreographer in the, and I said, as I watched her, I said, you know, John's kind of letting you direct. And she said, oh, I'm just choreographing and I'm moving people around. And I said, you're a director. Oh, dad, you know, I'm a choreographer. Uh, so then she moved to Chicago and we moved her into this three-story walk-up apartment with her friend, Murray Mackay. And before I left, she said, what should I do about my name? And I w did numerology. And she said, I need a name there. I'm going to be successful. Will Natalie Heidi do it? And I said, well, it'll be tough because nobody, <laughs> nobody can spell it and nobody can pronounce it. So I looked out the window and I saw Rockwell and I said, Rachel Rockwell, sounds a little bit like a stripper, but, <laughs> but I think it's going to, the numbers are perfect. I mean, there's limelight and illumination, there's some financial success. Um, I think that's good. And she goes, Rachel Rockwell, I think that's good. So the next day after Glory and I left her, um, she called and she said, well, guess what I did? And I said, what? She said, well, I'm a small town girl, so I went on a walk. And, and I said, really? Uh, just a neighborhood walk? Yeah, I went on a walk and you know, I was wearing a halter top and my little short shorts. And, and I was walking through this area and there were lots of guys standing around, but nobody whistled at me and nobody approached me. And 
when I got home, Murray said, what, what were you doing? And she said, well, I went for a long walk. And he said, we live in Cabrini Green. And she said, what does that mean? And she said, he said, either you have guardian angels or they thought you were crazy. <laughs> <clears throat> But, but no, nobody bothered her, and it could have been a little bit of both. Um, as you know, Rachel crammed a 40-plus year career into 25 years. <clears throat> and she did it uh, because she loved it. But what you don't know is that a couple of years ago, she said, Dad... I just don't think I'm gonna do that anymore. And I said, do what? She goes, you know, what I'm doing now. And I said, why would you not wanna do that? And she said, well, I think I need to do something that actually helps people. And I said, Rachel, I have been to so many of your shows and I've never been to one where actors didn't come up to me afterward and say, I would work for her again for nothing. This has been the greatest experience of my life. She made me better than I've ever been. She, she created a family. I mean, we just loved each other. I love working for her. And I said, and then I've been out in the lobby where the audience walked out and they, some of them actually felt a little transformed. I said, do you have any idea what effect you've had on people? Really? Yeah. So the last two years have been pretty amazing because when she got ill, uh, she continued to work, and she, I went to Minnesota while she did Wimpy Kid, and she was taking chemo and then going right to rehearsal, and she made a little video telling all of the kids in the cast not to worry that it, it wasn't, I mean, some of them thought that they could catch what she had, and she worked, she worked with those kids that really didn't have much experience. I mean, it turned out to be a beautiful thing. And then she said, what am I going to do? I have all these jobs. I have, I'm going to go to San Diego, and I'm going to be in New York City, and I'm, these offers are coming in from all over, and I won't, I won't see Jake, and what will I do? And I said, well, I could come and homeschool him and travel with you. And she said, would you, would you? And I said, yes. So it was maybe the best two years of my life. Uh, because I got to spend more time with my daughter than I had in a long time. I got to spend two really formative years with my grandson. Uh, and when we went to Seattle, I knew, I knew that it wasn't going to turn out well. Um, she acted like it was going to be fine. But I said, you know, I think maybe Jake should stay with his dad for a few weeks. And why don't we just get settled and then we'll bring him out. And she said, fine. So we were only there like six days when it really hit hard. Um, <clears throat> and she was really just kind of bedridden, and she would text me, you know, all through the night, Dad, can you get me this? Can you get me that? I'm so sorry. And I would come in, she'd just say, I'm so sorry, Dad. And she finally said, hey, Daddy, you know, when I was a baby, you changed my diaper and you fed me, and now you're doing the same thing, and I'm so sorry. And I said, I would not trade this for anything. Okay, let me... Uh, <clears throat> Let me end with a song that I wrote for her. I'm not going to sing it. You're lucky. Uh, based on my memory of her as a little girl, and it's called Daddy, Will You Dance With Me? I'll just do a verse and a chorus. Five years old, big brown eyes. She was daddy's girl. Wow, I forgot my own song. <laughs> <laughs> Ballet shoes, Disney books lost in her own world. A dream is a wish your heart makes played again and again as she stood lightly on his feet with her hand in his, saying, Daddy, will you dance with me? Promise that I'll always be your favorite little girl. Don't ever let me go. It's not the same when I dance alone. Daddy, will you always dance with me? Thank you.
There was a time our happiness seemed never ending. I was so sure that where we were heading was right. Life was a road so certain and straight and unbending. Never a crossroad in sight Back in the days When we spoke in civilized voices Women in white And sturdy young men at the oar In the days when I let you make All my choices Enchanted. If I had dreams, then I let you dream them for me. Back in the days, when everything seemed so much clearer. Women in white who knew what their lives had in store. Where are they now, those women who stay? That was Corey Goodrich singing Back to Before from Ragtime, a show that would win Rachel's first Jeff Award for Best Direction. And the show also won for Outstanding Production that year. Uh, now I would like to introduce to you Chris Jones, the Chief Theater Critic for the Chicago Tribune. Hello, everybody. It's, uh, I'm very honored, truly, that uh, Rachel's family asked me to be here tonight. So I'm in the middle of leading this two weeks critics retreat, if you can believe such a thing exists, at the uh, Eugene O'Neill Center in Connecticut, where, they, uh, where they're developing a whole slew of new musicals and new plays at the same time. So I just flew in an hour ago. My wife met me at the airport with a suit and a tie, and I'm going back in the morning. So I was able to write this, what I'm saying to you right now about Rachel, early this morning, staring out at 
lawns and at the deep blue Atlantic Ocean, peering through the New England mist like I was in some one-man version of Carousel, even as a ton of new musicals like Ride the Cyclone, new musicals that Rachel would have dearly loved to direct, I suspect, sprung up all around me. I had to write this. I got up early, and I could see all these different creative teams moving to different rehearsal rooms at the O'Neill. I thought to myself, this is so sad and also so incredibly perfect. So there's a great story in theater circles about a terribly misguided production of Annie that ended up not with the little orphan and the Christmas tree and the dog, Sandy, and the final chorus of tomorrow. I mean, it had all of that, but it actually ended with Annie waking up back in her bed at the orphanage. <laughs> staring into the face of Miss Hannigan. Get back to work, she said. You are only dreaming. <laughs> now, <laughs> true story. Rachel, they closed it down quick, I think. Um, Rachel was all about truth in her work. I mean, she worked in Chicago theater, after all. And she once told me that the only thing she hated more than hand gestures on kids was the exploitation of their dimples. And whether the show was Oliver or The Sound of Music or Ragtime or Billy Elliot, whether it was on the pier, off the pier, in the loop, out of the loop, in Oak Brook, in Aurora, in Lincolnshire, her work with young artists, any artist really, was simply peerless in its veracity and, it, and in its ascribing of agency, however messy the consequences to young people. And she was a font of conceptual ideas, but she could never have had that idea about Annie. She believed too much in hope. So this morning, I'm looking out at the sea, and I'm thinking about Rachel's shows, and I saw almost all of them over the years, and I could go on and on about the moments in so many of them that moved me or revealed things to me or made my eyes moisten with tears, but many of you know that because many of you helped her create them. But here's the thing. It's one thing to have a cool idea about a show that will get you a good review, maybe from a guy like me who has seen these shows many times and bores very easily. And he does. <laughs> but I, I try not to forget something, that in the audience for The Sound of Music every night are young people who've never seen how music can save a family, who've never known that dance can mean a chance for a minus kid, who've never wondered where love is, who didn't know that they could find it in the theater, who've yet to learn that you can't go back to before, and who need to focus instead on the wheels of their own dream, and people who don't know where to look for a big, bright, beautiful world. Rachel, a woman whose contribution to musical theater in Chicago was without equal, who absolutely did for musicals here what Steppenwolf did for plays, or Sheldon did for improv, or Mary did for myth and story. Never forgot those first timers. I guess I, I could talk about so much of her work, but you know, I really love that production of Annie, so let's go back to Annie. <laughs> I remember the projections, Mike's projections and Linda Buchanan's set, and I remember thinking we have a much greater sense here of the despairing context that Annie lives in. And Annie belted out her tomorrow as a kind of a runaway in the city, dwarfed by the dark horrors of the harsh streets. But in the last chorus, the dawn slowly and subtly arrived behind her. It was a brief moment, but I've never forgotten it, and this must be six years ago now. There was no better way to frame a show that was all about the power of optimism as a kid. So I wish, you know, Rachel being gone was a dream, and that you might all just wake up to see her telling you to get back to work. But it's not. We can only be thankful for all that she gave us. And she gave that not just to her colleagues, but to the people of Chicagoland who came to her shows and who needed her. I hope you'll think of her when you see the dawn coming and imagining a lucky girl playing Annie, living her best life, and singing, Tamara, Tamara. I love you tomorrow. You're only a day away. Thank you.
Thank you, Chris. Now please welcome to the stage Laura Penn, the Executive Director of SDC, the Stage and Directors and Choreographers Society, Rachel's Union and My Union. Thank you. It's an honor and a privilege to be here this evening, and it's with a huge dose of humility that I attempt to find some way to share with you the collective heartache of our national community of directors and choreographers upon Rachel's passing. It was 2008, the year Rachel became a card-carrying member of SDC, that I found myself at the desk of this odd and wonderful union that represents some 3,000 professionals across the country. Recognizing that I am in a room likely filled with mostly theater makers, I risk taking a moment to say, they are funny people, <laughs> directors and choreographers. A complicated, loving, terrified bunch who against all odds with a singularity forge a path that leads us towards the footlights. How they do that is as individual as each of them. It's been described as a kind of alchemy, a just right mix of vision and skill, rigor and flexibility, ambition and sensibility, resiliency and vulnerability. Directors are historians, they're jugglers, engineers, parents. While staging, they are mathematicians, they are poets, and they're often lonely. The only one of their kind in a room, and they are there for everyone else. What then separates the good from the great, and what allows the great to break through and head towards brilliance? I'm not completely sure, but I don't think it's luck. I know it takes work, hard work. When I think about what Rachel built here for herself and her family and her Chicago community and what she was on the brink of nationally, it doesn't appear to me that it was luck at all. She had a kind of fierce devotion, a relentless pursuit of excellence and a dedication that opened doors and kept them open for her. She had Chicago. You saw potential in her and gave her space, opportunity, and she didn't let you down. She was loyal and you cared for her. That's not luck. It takes work to have such a full life. She respected the past while pushing through to something new. And we were all going with her for the ride she was poised to take us on. She, it's hard to believe but Rachel was one of far too few women working at the level she was working at, while raising a child, having a family, serving as a community leader. She was a member of SDC's choreography committee and was always available to serve. The only no anyone can remember hearing from Rachel was when she was approached to consider running for the SDC executive board to represent this region. She declined graciously and then some days later called upon my colleague, Adam Levi, our staff rep to Chicago. She wanted us to know that she had been diagnosed and that it was no reflection on her commitment to the union and her fellow artists. She wanted to be sure Adam knew she would continue to be there for him, whatever he needed. She was passionate about cultivating respect and protection for artists and the work they create. She pushed everyone around her to continue growing and exploring new and better ideas, including those of us at SDC. She never took a pass. Rachel often provided an unexpected, simple, yet razor sharp idea that opened it all up, moving us towards successful resolve, whatever the challenge. I expect this was your experience with her in the rehearsal hall or around the table at a production meeting and maybe the dinner table. The thoughtful way that she served the union showed respect both for herself and her fellow artists, as well as a deep admiration for and commitment to the Chicago theaters she loved working in. Last fall, she was awarded the Callaway Award by the SDC Foundation. 
It's the only peer award given to a director or choreographer for work on a specific production. It was for Ride the Cyclone. 15 directors and choreographers of note saw over 300 off-Broadway productions that year. To rise to the attention of this committee was no mean feat. To win is, an, is extraordinary and is truly a marker for future success. When an artist comes along who has made a play and is building a body of work that captures the imagination of her peers, it is thrilling. She took a moment in her remarks to thank a few of those who has inspired her, a few who made her believe that she could do anything. Susan Stroman, Graziella Danielle, Susan Schulman, Marsha Milgram Dodge, Kathleen Marshall. I know they wouldn't mind if I spoke for them today to say that, in turn, she inspired them. She closed her remarks by saying, and now it is my great pleasure and my most solemn responsibility to do the same and to make sure that I nurture and that I support and that I open doors. Tonight I need to take just a moment to talk about another remarkable person with us this evening who knows as well as anyone what a director does and needs and he knows the impact of loss all too much from personal experience. Tonight I get to announce the establishment of a scholarship fund at SDC Foundation for college-bound children of SDC members. Our goal of $100,000 will allow us to grant $5,000 a year, and the extraordinary Kevin McCollum is seeding this fund tonight with $20,000. She was breaking through with a force and a spirit. There's an ecosystem in our field, a diversity of artistry in the SDC membership. We have interpreters and creative artists, stars, auteurs, craftsmen and women, restagers, generative artists. Each plays a critical role in keeping the theater industry vibrant. When we lose a star too soon, a leader too soon, it becomes incumbent upon us to ensure that their work and legacy holds and somehow permeates the next generation. We're up to the task. We'll re we will remember Rachel. Thank you. And now here are just a few of Rachel's friends to share some special moments. Please welcome Stacy Flaster, Heidi Kettenring, Mark Kaplan, Mary Ernster, Emily Rome, Nancy Voigts, and George Keating. Rachel loved this story, repeating it with many embellishments. We met during Hello Dolly at Marriott in 1995. We used to smoke cigarettes outside after the show, <laughs> even though I had quit. She would say, come on, let's go outside and have one. And it sounded very appealing. So of course, I would go outside and have one or two or three. So during one of our many private, sort of whispery conversations in the dressing room, she was on my left, and I was closest to the bathroom before the renovation of the dressing rooms there. I said to her about her current husband, Rich. Oh, by the way, this guy was so good looking and adorable and friendly and nice. And I remember back when I was doing Crazy for You at, at uh, Candlelight, he was extremely complimentary about the choreography. And I remember thinking, how does he know so much about Susan Stroman? Anyway. Back to the dressing room in 1995. I asked her if she was in love with her husband, Rich. To this day, I do not know why I asked her that. She turned her head slightly to the right, stage makeup half on, and she said, no, I'm not. I was stunned because I didn't expect her to say that. I said, what? 
how could that be possible? He's perfect. You guys are perfect together. You have a perfect house. You guys both love to cook and decorate. You both like Bon Appetit magazine. <laughs> and I remember she said, things aren't always as they appear. Well, many of us know how that turned out. <laughs> Luckily, Rachel went on to meet the love of her life, Garth. That moment in 1995 in the dressing room, that was the moment we went from a show friendship to a real friendship. So just a little, uh, just very little over 13 years ago, uh, I drove out to Berwyn to visit Rachel and Garth because they had uh, just been given the wonderful gift of Jake. Jake had just been born. So I drove out to visit them and meet the baby. And I got there, and Rachel ushers me inside, and we were going to have a visit. And she said, before we have our visit, I would really like to show you the birthing video. <laughs> to which I believe my response was, oh, oh, no. Um, I, I, uh, that's, that's a very private moment. Um, I, I have issues with, uh, uh, blood and things. Um, and Rachel grabbed me by the hands and she said, please, please come share this with me. This is the greatest thing I have ever done. It would mean so much to me if you shared this with us. So Rachel and Garth and I, we went into that, the front uh, office uh, of their house, and I've never seen a birth of any kind. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry, I had seen my, my puppies, uh, my dog give birth, but that's different. Um, uh, we, we went in there, and, not in, and this was also very special because it was a water birth. So in any event, we stood there, we all held hands, and so there's the pool, and, um, and Rachel is in labor, and it was, uh, you know, labor. It was awful, but then, she, <laughs> but then she touched the water, and I swear it was like Jake was like, I'm ready. And it was over in a heartbeat, and it was one of the most beautiful things I have ever seen. Not only because it was uh, a beautiful childbirth, but because I was standing there holding hands with Rachel and Garth, and they both turned to me, and they, they asked. They were like, wasn't it wonderful? And, I, it, and it, it, it truly was. And it's a perfect example of one of the many wonderful things about Rachel, but she always wanted you to go on the adventure with her. So, Rachel, thank you for taking me on so many adventures, and thank you for making me watch that beautiful, <laughs> beautiful moment in your life. So my particular, hopefully brief, uh, memory <laughs> of, of um, a moment with Rachel, a moment with Rachel, uh, actually <laughs> happened right up there, around where that lovely misty light is, because, well, more about that later. It, 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 was, a, it was a moment of, of, uh, of determination. It was a moment of making strong emotional choices. It was a moment of a powerful uh, moment before on stage. I was in my music in my head and all that other actory stuff that I've been trying to decipher for years now. <laughs> but more about that later. I want to say, just because Robert and I were talking about it. Uh, my first foray with Rachel was Flash about 23 years before that in the widely discussed Mark R Robin Little Mermaid. <laughs> yeah. Who were you? I was Bo Bell, Nancy. Yes. <laughs> so, also, now David was too. David was Turtel, Heidi's husband, and I was Bo Bell. Okay, and at one point, I was on ice skates. I did, that's all there is to it. That's really not all there is to it, because that's, that is the first time I met Rachel. Um, I spent most of the show talking about you know, commitment and moment before. I was sort of on the floor in a heap trying to remember lines. Rachel, and no one has said this, as Flutter the Butterfly, on her own was about a seven-foot wingspan. No wires, folks, her own arms with this beautiful costume. And for an hour and 15 minutes, on point. Yeah, okay? So, 
that feeds into my story flash forward 20 years, 20 years in the future because it is about commitment. It was Les Mis, and those of you who know, uh, have rehearsed here at the lovely Oak Brook, thanks for letting us be here. Um, up there is the rehearsal room. It is, what, maybe a quarter of the size of this, of this here. Yeah, it's, you know, I mean, I think four of us would fit up there the, doing what we're doing now. <laughs> but it's lovely. At any rate, <laughs> Rachel, of course, in her inimitable way, it was tech. We were finally out of that room, and um, she had a lot of stories to tell in a lot of ways during this show. Not just the bottom story. There were, I think, you know, there was something up there, up there, up there. Which leads me back up to here. Staircase, where I get to make my first entrance with all of that Les Mis music, you know, that doesn't mean anything. I love it, but I don't, yeah, there's no stage direction in the thing. It says, ba-run, ba-run, ba-run. And Rachel looks at me, she goes, we'll deal with it when we get to the stage. Great. So here's the stage. Stairs, like two stories. Beautiful. Thank you, Kevin Debonette. Brick wall. <laughs> Filthy, dirty French brick wall. Cheese stuff, everything on it. Dirty, wet. Maybe cheese, I don't know. He did a real good job with it. So that was where I was making my entrance. I, I, I played Tenardier, so, um, and again, I'm not supposed to know what the music means. I played Tenardier. Um, I, they, she was talking about the entrance, and we had never really staged it. So it's probably about 11.30 at night at this point. She and I are up there, and we both have a light bulb moment at the same, same time. She looks at this, she goes, how do you think this got this dirty? I'm like, well, I have an idea. And it was as if we both said it at the same time, Lights will come up, you'll be discovered, <laughs> relieving yourself on the set. <laughs> well, you know, d everybody loved it, besides perhaps my show wife, Sharon Sachs, who kept yelling, too much! <laughs> Which, by the way, she did in a few previews as well until that got cut. Uh, but for me, that was the moment, oddly enough, Rachel said, our symbiotic sense of, of in instinct was the same, and it was really beautiful. And she looked at me, and she winked at me, and she goes, yeah, that's going to work. So, Rachel, <laughs> for the best stage, most purposeful stage exit I ever made, stage entrance I made, I thank you for that. Like, <laughs> you. Well, now, I'm really mad at Mark Robin for not putting me in that Little Mermaid play. <laughs> I missed out. <laughs> I loved Rachel for so many, many reasons, but for one of the most important was, was she really got things done. You know, she knew how to get things done. If anybody's done a kid's show, you know that you have a very short rehearsal period. It's about 10 days, no previews, boom, you open. Well, I've done, I don't know, quite a few numbered uh, kid's show versions of Wizard of Oz with Rachel. Uh, but the first one we did was at the Marriott. This was 2007. And of course, because of the briefness of the rehearsal process, the tech element was a little behind. And uh, she had already bought in a, a family quilt for Dorothy's spinning bed. I don't know, uh, Jake, maybe that was your quilt that you had at home. But, um, but the thing that was really missing were these four fabric strips that were shimmery and green, and they were to drop from the grid to reveal Emerald City. And they didn't come, and they didn't come, and they weren't there. So finally, Rachel goes home after rehearsal, and she goes and finds the fabric and sews them together and brings them back the next day. Now, I have no idea where she got that fabric. I mean, you can't walk into Joanne's Fabrics and buy 75 yards of sh shimmery, twinkly green fabric, but she did. I don't know where she found it. And I swear to God, she would have been up in the grid hanging them herself if the crew hadn't stepped in and, and done it for her. But uh, Rachel, she was the goddess of getting it done. I'm finally in a chorus line. <laughs> Um, uh, side note, 
Uh, the most embarrassing hour of my life was for a callback for a chorus line that <laughs> Rachel was choreographing. Uh, but to hear that story, you got to meet me in the bar. Uh, one less person in the world who witnessed that. Thank you. <laughs> um, anyway, I'm here to tell you that Rachel was a magical matchmaker. She uh, knew. Uh, she knew the trick to casting was mostly just putting the right people in the room to find the perfect chemistry. And sometimes that carried over into real life. Um, Rachel was crazy enough to put me in 14 of her shows in the last nine or 10 years. So we spent a lot of time together. And over those years, we became actual friends. Uh, she was one of the few people who could uh, break through this brick wall of mine that I often have up. And uh, we were rehearsing one of those shows uh, in the middle of a scene one day. Uh, she pulled me aside, stopped the scene, pulled me aside and said, how are you doing? Are you, is everything okay at home? How are you? And I, I assumed she was talking about my character and of course did the whole actor thing, was like, oh yeah, let's dig into that. Uh, uh, but soon realized that she just wanted to have a chat she just wanted to check in on me because she was that kind of person who cared about the person first uh, and character second. Um, we had a little chat and uh, it ended with, I, I just want, I, I, I want you to be happy. You deserve to be happy. Anyway, let's take it from the top of the scene. Uh, <laughs> and I just was stunned. Uh, it'll last with me forever because she just said, ah, you deserve to be happy. I had never really thought about that. And uh, soon after that, uh, she continued this journey by uh, putting two people in a room that on paper should never work, and that is me and Steph Tovar. Uh, she uh, cast us in a show together and with a mischievous twinkle in her eye said, I think you guys are going to be great together. And um, me, uh, the uh, sarcastic introvert specializing in melancholy, and Steph Tovar, the overly friendly life of the party specializing in loud. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, I was like, okay, we'll see, I trust you, Rachel. Uh, and day after day, she saw my brick wall come down, and she saw his puppy dog eyes, uh, which my dad can call out, he called it too. Um, and uh, she came to my dressing room one day and said, I think, I think this is working. I think you are really good for him. And I'm not sure if he's good for you yet, but we'll see. <laughs> Sorry, her words, not mine. Um, and uh, I later found out she went to his dressing room and said, if you hurt her, I swear to God. Uh, and you did not want to be on her list. Uh, she cares for her girls. Uh, and she changed the entire trajectory of my life by having a conversation with me and caring about the person inside of the character on stage. And I'll never forget it. <sighs> she could... Um, if you look to the side of you, look around the room, you'll probably know that uh, she put you in a room with your significant other or your best friend or your tribe because she knew how to put the right people in a room to find magic, to create the perfect chemistry in real life and on stage. Thank you, Rachel. I officially met Rachel um, when I went to an audition for a show that she was directing. And I was so nervous because, I mean, God, it was the Rachel Rockwell and I'd never auditioned for her before. So I walk into the room and before I could even say anything, she said to me, oh my God, I love your skirt. <laughs> and I thought, well, she's not even just a brilliant director, she is a brilliant girlfriend. <laughs> so 
then through the years, I learned that Rachel, when she was directing a show, it was really, really important to her that there was a reason for that show to be put on the stage, that, you know, to make an audience sit through two and a half hours of something, it should be, it should be life-changing, or it should make you think, or it should, you know, it should have some real value, a real message. And look at the show she directed. I mean, there's Miss Saigon and Ragtime and even 42nd Street, which I did for her a couple of times, was about people struggling through the Depression. And then along came Xanadu. <laughs> and the first day of rehearsal, she basically threw up her arms and said, there's absolutely no reason to do Xanadu. So we are just gonna have, <laughs> so we are just gonna have a lot of fun. And so that's what we did. We worked really, really, really hard, but we pretty much just laughed really, 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 really a lot. <laughs> and it came down to the time when she was about ready to stage the, the last number. And the cast, we were like, what in the world is she going to do to possibly top all the other ridiculous brilliance she's already thrown out on that stage? But of course she did. She topped herself. So the finale was um, Gina Milo came out, and she was singing the title song, Xanadu. And the fan was blowing her hair from the, from the orchestra pit, and the smoke was floating across the stage, and the disco balls dropped and spun around, and, oh, and then the cast comes out, it's roller skating in the worst, queerest 70s costumes you could possibly imagine. I mean, picture Sean Blake in gold lame hot pants, for starters. <laughs> but then we got to the very end of the song, and sure enough, the piece de la resistance at the rehearsal, Rachel brings out rainbow disco rhythmic gymnastic ribbons <laughs> to choreograph the rest of the number. Xanadu, Xanadu. I'm sure he did it all wrong and she would just hate me for that because we worked on that and worked it and worked it and worked it till it was perfect. And it was, it was perfect in every way. But my favorite memory about doing Xanadu was the first night of our tech rehearsal. And it was nighttime, as I said. And um, Garth was also here. He was uh, designing the sound for the show. So Jake was sitting out there with Rachel, as he often was at rehearsals. And he was sitting next to her at the tech table in his little pajamas with his little blanket. And, and it was just amazing because I was watching and Rachel the whole time while she was, you know, she was designing light cues and set cues and all the minutiae that a director has to do during the tech process. And while she's doing this, she's also opening up a juice box for Jake and, and doling out the little bags of snacks that she'd prepackaged for him. And I thought, oh my God, with all she had to think about, she remembered that because first and foremost, Rachel was a mom. And then Stephanie Benetti reminded me a couple of days ago that at the first day of rehearsal, she had shared with us that that summer, she and Jake had just loved jamming out to ELO songs. And I just love the image of that, of them in their car jamming out. And don't you know, as soon as the orchestra, as soon as the band kicked in with I'm Alive, Jake and Rachel were up on their feet, him and his little jammies, and they're rocking out like they were at a concert. Oh, it was pure joy, pure love, pure Rachel. I have a short story for Jake. Uh, as you probably know, in the fall of 2004, your mom was in the Broadway company of Mamma Mia. Your mom and I, at that time in our lives, were in the habit of talking at least once a day, even when one of us was remote. I was driving one night, about to get on Lakeshore, when the phone rang. It was your mom. Uh, but I could tell something was up. She had big news that had nothing to do with being on Broadway. I had to pull over because we were both so overwhelmed, we were laughing and crying at the same time, one of our very favorite combinations. <laughs> she was pregnant. So before you made your first entrance, you were on Broadway. <laughs> now I want to take you back to 1999. It was our first show on stage together, not our first show, because our first show she choreographed me in a kid show, okay. <clears throat> Not that one, we did that one later. Um, uh, this was the premiere of Peggy Sue Got Married. That was a musical at Marriott Theater. It was in 1999, I already said that. 
That was the experience that launched our intense friendship. It was an exciting time. We got to work with music legend Bob Gaudio, one of the original Four Seasons before he went on, before he went on to create Jersey Boys. The screenwriters from the original movie were there to help us create our parts in this new musical, so it was a little bit Hollywood and a little bit Broadway. <laughs> our roles were Kenny and Gail. And we understudied Peggy Sue and Charlie, played by Susan Moniz and David Burnham. As the understudies, director David Bell often staged Rachel and I together. We danced together in the opening number in which uh, one second show Saturday night before the big spin where her skirt twirled out around her, center of section three, the press section. <laughs> <laughs> She grabbed my arm, and she shook her head, and she said, Don't spin me! I forgot to wear my dance pants! <laughs> <laughs> There's a dirtier version of that. <laughs> David paired Rachel and I together in scenes, sometimes as set dressing, but at the Marriott, you cannot hide. When we weren't featured, we would have long moments on stage while Susan and David developed their love story. But from the first rehearsal, we just stayed in character and improvised. And this developed with each rehearsal and with each performance. We surprised each other and just kept saying yes and adding to this story. And I dare say we looked more forward to these unscripted moments uh, as almost as much as the scenes and numbers in which we were focal. And that is how we got to know each other. That is how we became friends. By the time we were in previews, the subplot had become quite a soap opera, and the rest of the cast had gotten drawn in, and I mean everyone. Susan was playing along, Paula Scrifano was the mom, and she found ways to get in on it. Michael Hendricks joined in from the booth. I, I even created the obligatory soap opera evil twin. It was ridiculous. <laughs> Now, mind you, the whole time, we're also playing Peggy Sue and Charlie in understudy rehearsal and having to make out, and basically, we just fell in love the way people do. The way people do, the way we do, when you are committed to something and having a great time, and just getting paid to make theater. <laughs> now, <clears throat> the last three weeks of the run, uh, the soap opera of Kenny and Gail was abruptly ended. <laughs> <clears throat> Steph Tovar broke his ankle playing softball or something. <laughs> I mean, what a jackass. Okay, yeah, all right. <laughs> Sorry, Steph, love you. Um, and uh, Paul, S Paul Slade Smith was out, if I remember rightly, with a family emergency. Um, it, a bunch of us then moved roles, whether we were understudies or not. I replaced Aaron Phelan in the role that he vacated as he replaced one of those guys or both of them, I don't remember. So Kenny was gone. <laughs> Rachel, yeah. Uh, Rachel. <laughs> Rachel, in typical fashion, was now going on alternately as Peggy Sue for Susan, I think she was in the next show, and, as, uh, and for Paula, and, uh, who was the mother, and sometimes in the same day. She, I'm not joking. Um, so Gail was coming and going. Now, okay, time travel is part of the plot of Peggy Sue Got Married. Peggy Sue wakes up back in time and has this chance to revisit this love affair and see how it all went wrong. Now, in keeping with the time travel theme, Rachel insisted that we go to elaborate lengths to bring the, the saga of Kenny and Gail to a close. <laughs> Kenny and Gail, now everyone's also playing along and pretending like they're still really into it, right? Um, Kenny and Gail had been transported to the future in which Kenny and Gail got married. Between shows one day, we dressed as Kenny and Gail in a tuxedo and a bridal gown. We even got Nancy Massimi involved, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm certain that that bridal gown actually was from the first wedding from Rich. She, like, dug that out. Uh, we took pictures of our wedding, and we made thank you notes, and we sent them back from the future. 
I mean, we had full-time jobs and we were still doing this, right? <laughs> we sent them back from the future to the cast as closing presents and we spent a long time with updates on what happened to each and in every one of their individual characters in the future. <laughs> Rachel never did anything halfway. And back in the day when she was just an actor, she brought all of us together. She inspired us and drove us to create with passion and joy and innocence long before she became the grand director that everyone knows from the last decade. Rachel was a good friend. She let me live in her house for months at a time. She let me care for Jake as a baby. As a baby. She fed me brilliant food and treated me like family on holidays. I chaperoned her to the vet with her cat Frankie on his final day and held her hand through the weeks leading up to that before Jake Rachel had her cats, and she adored them. She was the only person in the world I could ever carpool to work with. <laughs> we shared many laughs, many tears, many dreams, many hurts, and many, many curtain calls. I miss her, and I will always love her. <laughs> She never showed me the birthing video. <laughs> Thank you for those quick stories. Please now welcome Michael Mahler singing from October Sky, a show developed at Marriott's Lincolnshire with Aaron Thielen. Aaron, Michael, and Rachel would remount the show a year later at the Old Globe in San Diego. One, two, three. Everything about this town is digging deep and hunker down and stay in line. I've been waiting here forever, praying on a change that never came. But someone somewhere far away has built us all a better day and made it shine. Something deep inside of me says nothing's ever gonna be the same. Cause when I look to the stars, what once was a wall is now a door. To everything I've been praying for, way past Venus and Mars. When I Look to the stars, the whole world can see what I can see. I'm right on the edge of history. When I look to the stars, watch it streak across the sky, a tiny beacon blazing by a satellite. Bringing in a brand new day for everyone in every neighborhood. Something I don't understand starts burning deep within me, and I swear tonight, reaching past the atmosphere will be my ticket out of here for good. Cause when I look to the stars, they're closer than they have ever seen. To all of the kids who ever dream, now the future is ours. When I look to the stars, I'll learn all the things I need to know to get me as far as I can go. When I look to the stars, to win I will learn how to 
fly. I don't know how I'll do it, but I will try. By God, I'll try. Cause when I look to the stars, I no longer feel so all alone. With dreams I can hold but never own Just a glimpse through the bars I'm gonna shoot for the stars This poor cold wood kid has joined the race I'll write to you all from outer space Cause I will get to the stars Good evening, I'm Terry James. From the Marriott. <laughs> when Universal enlisted Aaron to develop and write October Sky, he immediately grabbed his writing partner, Mike, and friend Rachel, I'm so sorry <laughs> to come along on the ride. Aaron and Rachel had a unique and shared bond with their theatrical paths intertwining for almost a quarter of a century. Some might be surprised to know that Rachel's first gig at the Marriott was as an extra stitcher in our costume shop. In 1995, I was the music director at Marriott when we cast both Rachel and Aaron in their first show there at the Marriott. It was Hello Dolly, and Rachel was a hysterical Ermengarde. <laughs> Ten years later, with paths leading to the other side of the table, they would both do their final show as actors for Marriott in Pajama Game. Rachel was a beautiful dancer and comedic actress. The passion, focus, attention to detail were always there a perfectionist. In Pajama Game, Rachel, as Gladys, had a scene where she gets drunk and passes out in Hernando's hideaway. Rachel wanted her head to drop to the table when she passed out. Simple enough. In previews, her head appears to hit the table and gets a nice laugh, but she didn't think it was quite right. Next preview, her head hits the table and there's a loud thud bigger laugh. <laughs> but I told her you can't do that because you're going to get hurt. Seeming to state the obvious, she says, well, my head isn't really hitting the table. I was embarrassed that I had no idea how she was doing it, so I went along with it. <laughs> but regardless, she still felt that it wasn't right. So by the time we pressed, her head hits the table, bounces, it hits a second time, and a third. A huge laugh, and she gets a Jeff nomination. <laughs> As artistic director, Aaron ta tapped Rachel to direct at Marriott for the first time, a TYA production of Your Good Man, Charlie Brown. This would be the first of numerous children's theater productions that she directed and choreographed. In 2007, I remember exactly where I was standing in the back of the house, during a question and answer session of one of those kid shows. I asked her if she'd like to direct Nonsense in our upcoming season. She was so happy, jumping up and down, clapping and saying yes, that I had to make sure she heard me correctly and that it was Nonsense. <laughs> <clears throat> I 
She had, and she was off and running. As a director, she always approached her projects with a keen eye on the female characters, the female perceptive, and making sure that that storytelling was clear and leading. The Nonsense Reviews even mentioned the surprising poignancy that Rachel brought to the piece. This would become her trademark. In all, Rachel would go on to appear, choreograph, or direct 26 productions for us. Again and again, she brought that unique perspective and grace to each production. She challenged her cast, she challenged us, and perhaps the secret to her success, she challenged herself. She was so proud to be old school. Her last show for us, Mamma Mia, taking chemo treatments on her day off and never missing a rehearsal. The Chicago theater community is often described as family, and it is. We support and lift each other up, celebrating all of our successes. Our theaters have each claimed Rachel as their own, and I think that's a beautiful compliment to Rachel, a testament to her incredible body of work. Only in Chicago could a ballet dancer from Indiana take the path from ensemble to principal, dancer to choreographer, stitcher to director, and master storyteller. On behalf of Aaron and I and everyone at Marriott, I give all my love to Rachel and her family, and the same to you. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. That was beautiful. Please help me welcome Michael Lindner, who will sing a song from Shrek, which, where he performed it at Chicago Shakespeare Theater. It's a big, bright, beautiful world With happiness all around It's peaches and cream If our dream comes true It's a big, bright, beautiful world With possibilities everywhere if true love is blind, maybe you won't mind the view. I know I'm not the handsome prince for whom you've waited. I don't have a fancy castle, and I'm not sophisticated. An ogre and a princess, I admit, it's complicated. You've never read a book like this But fairy tales Should really be updated It's a big, bright, beautiful world I see it now I'll let it in I'll tear down a wall and build a spot for two to be with you. everyone. Um, I'm Rick Boynton. I'm the creative producer at Chicago Shakespeare Theater, and I'm so honored to be with family tonight celebrating this amazing woman. When I first met Rachel Rockwell, she was a dynamic actress, singer, and dancer who could light up a stage with every entrance she made. I put those titles in no particular order as she truly was a triple threat. I have to say, however, I was always in awe, just like Terry just said, how she could perfectly combine virtuoso dancing with impeccable comic timing. She was just a great performer. 
She was a natural. What I didn't know about her at the time was that there was a directing talent so signature and extraordinary that was waiting to emerge. A couple years after I became the creative producer at Chicago Shakespeare Theater, Rachel called to see if she and I could talk about her desire to direct. She wasn't the first to approach me about making a similar career move, but after the first five minutes, I knew this conversation was going to be different. Rachel's passion, vision, and determination were all so authentic and perfectly clear. She was going to be a director, and whether I could help her or not, she was going to make it happen and be successful at it. There was no question in her voice. She knew it was a truth that, quite honestly, simply needed to be realized. And realize it, she did. From that point forward, R Rachel took Chicago by storm, starting with TYA productions at Marriott and Drew Lane and Chicago Shakespeare Theater. She quickly became known for her impressive work and vast creativity. Everyone loved working with her. Actors, producers, designers, and crew. Truly everyone. Rachel was a force of nature. When she entered the rehearsal room, she did so with a confidence and a certainty that made all involved not only feel safe and secure, but excited about the artistic journey ahead. She knew where she wanted to take the show and knew the path to get there. Brilliant at visualizing how a show moved and equally powerful in her moment-to-moment -moment work with actors, she knew how to engage and challenge everyone to realize their best work. All was done with a perfect blend of compassion and high expectations. Rachel's work was rigorous, and she expected the same from each collaborator. She was truly born to direct. I'll never forget going to visit her in the hospital one day in Seattle. Her father was there, and we were talking about Rachel. She was born to direct, Gary said. She, was, she has always been the director. Without skipping a beat, the nurse, Autumn, I think her name was, said, oh yeah, she was born to direct. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? It wasn't sarcasm. I could see it in her face. She too felt comforted and safe in the fact that Rachel was truly in charge and knew what was going on and how and when things needed to happen. I just love that. Rachel lived life to the fullest and brought that humanity to her work. Her family was absolutely precious to her. Watching her with her son, Jake, was a beautiful lesson in parenthood. She loved deeply and brought that absolute joy of life to all she created. Two weeks before Rachel passed, she called me to check in, sharing the outpouring of support and affection she had received. She was truly astonished by it, and I, in turn, was floored by her astonishment. She had no idea how respected, how loved she was for her incredible talent, yes, but even more for her kindness and generosity to all. Rachel led with empathy. She understood theater as a collaborative form, knowing instinctively that respect and care for all involved created the best art. We collaborated on 11 projects together at Chicago Shakespeare Theater. I'm sorry. The last production we worked on was this amazing production called Ride the Cyclone. She sent me the script and the score to see if Chicago Shakespeare would be interested in producing it. Just as I read the last page, the phone rang. It was Rachel. <laughs> Don't read it. It's a funky read. It's really special and it needs to be up on its feet to really be understood. Can, you pl can we please do a stage reading? Well, two months later, as I watched and listened in our studio theater, I realized she was so right. The movement of that piece was crucial to its impact, and the show was incredibly special. We produced the musical the next year, collaborating with our dear friend Kevin McCollum, with Rachel directing and choreographing our critically acclaimed sold-out production. It was an experience and show I will cherish forever. 
Ride the Cyclone tells the story of six teenagers whose lives are cut short by a freak accident. It's surprising, extremely funny, profound, and very moving. The show asks, what is a life well lived? What significance do single moments of time hold? And does the length of one's existence determine a life lived well? The themes of this play will forever resonate with me, reminding me of my dear, dear friend and collaborator. My apologies. Rachel Rockwell died far too soon. There were so many more stories still to tell and so many more lives left to touch. But oh my God, she had a life well lived. And all who knew her worked with her and loved her, were honored and humble to join her for any portion of that ride. Thank you very much. There have been so many individuals and entities that have helped the family through this difficult time. Now we'd like to bring Joseph Benincasa from the Actors Fund to the stage. Uh, Mamma Mia and Showboat. Rachel performed in benefits of each show for the Actors Fund and she played her part to advance Season of Concern and Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS. She cared about her colleagues as she so passionately cared about the art of choreography and direction. And while the Actors Fund is helping Garth deal with medical bills and technical issues, and because we will be there to support him and Jake in the future, I wish we had been more present when Rachel first became ill. From coast to coast, direct financial assistance, help with health care and insurance, career counseling, affordable, special needs and senior housing are all services provided by the Actors Fund. But for most people, it's probably our seniors residents in New Jersey that first comes to mind when people think about the fund. People seem to remember that Neil Simon's Sunshine Boys live there. My wife Nancy and I raised two boys and a girl, all unique and accomplished. Our middle child, Katie, was a dancer. She died six years ago at 32 of a sudden heart attack caused by something in her and my genetic makeup. Katie is very much on my mind every day, but especially today as we celebrate Rachel. No one knows what's ahead. We do know that we must always care for one another in good times and bad, and console one another in terrible times like this. With Rachel's passing and in her honor, the fund will reach out to every theater, soundstage, guild, and entertainment association in and around Chicago to make sure that every woman knows how the fund can help. This community will be connected to Stephen Hout in our office here and to teams of social workers who, while they may be in Los Angeles or New York or Nashville, are linked to national and local healthcare and social service networks, networks. This will be our tribute to Rachel. We will make sure that the fund is present in the life, in the lives of every woman. Our performing arts and entertainment community is a caring one, compassionate about justice and dedicated to making the world a better place. The stories we tell on stage reflect collaborations of so many diverse talents, all of whom are brought together by a director. The good ones are technically sound. The great ones are trusted and loved, as Rachel was. And uh, with a nod to Hal Prince and Sondheim and George Firth, here's to Rachel, who's like her, damn few. Thank you, Joe. Rachel directed and 
choreographed and performed at an unbelievable list of Chicago venues, including the Goodman, the Steppenwolf Timeline, the Paramount, Noble Fool, Apple Tree, Drury Lane South and Oak Brook, Marriott and Sh Chicago Shakespeare. Even Chicago could not contain her, and before long she would be traveling to Minneapolis, Seattle, Delaware, San Diego, and Sarasota. Now we'd like to bring on stage to share some more short stories from some more of Rachel's friends. Hi, I am Michael Hendricks. I'm the former stage manager at the Marriott Theater. And I can't believe this, but my story is about Peggy Sue got married too. Uh, except I'm sitting there listening to all this stuff and I'm thinking, I am a really lousy stage manager. I, I had no idea any of that stuff was going on. None whatsoever. I was really afraid George was going to tell the story. But my story is simply about a, a day during the run of, of Peggy Sue Got Married. As, as George said, Rachel never did anything halfway. She uh, was covering not only Susan as Peggy Sue, but she was also covering Paula as uh, Peggy Sue's mother. So one uh, Wednesday uh, with two shows, by chance, uh, she was going on for Paula at the matinee as the mother. And that evening, Rachel was forced to go on as Peggy Sue. Uh, so she basically played two huge roles in the course of two performances on the same day. And the amazing thing is that she treated it like it was just another day at the office. You know, she, she was totally prepared and she was absolutely fantastic. Fantastic in both roles. And she was about maybe 29 or 30 years old at that point. So my experience with Rachel, I worked, got a chance to work with her as an actress, uh, as a choreographer, and, and finally, ultimately, as a director. And... and um, it was just an unbelievable experience. Thank you. My name is Erica Mack. I was, thank you. Um, I, um, uh, I was Rachel's associate for 10 productions in her career. And I quickly learned three things among many uh, while working with Rachel. One of those was, Rachel loved to do shows that were technically ambitious. <laughs> yeah, and uh, which made always for a very interesting and yet challenging tech rehearsal and preview process. Two, Rachel always knew exactly what she wanted. Three, Rachel always had options B, C, D, and E if option A wasn't going to work out. So one of my jobs as her associate was to sit next to her during previews and take notes for her. Well, we were doing a show at Chicago Shakespeare Theater, a brand new musical called Ride the Cyclone, which of course has its fair share of intricate technical uh, uh, feats that have to happen, things that have to happen. So one of those was towards the end of the show, uh, Tiffany Tetro delivers a beautiful monologue um, where fog, a fog machine has to be pumped through backstage behind a curtain so that when the curtain is opened, it reveals a dreamlike, ethereal uh, atmosphere. Well, the problem was, it was a quiet moment in the show, and it was also a very small theater, intimate theater, where the audience was very close. So first preview, Rachel and I are sitting in the audience, and Tiffany is delivering her beautiful, heartfelt monologue, and all of a sudden we hear, shh, and Rachel grabs my knee as hard as she can, like she liked to do when things went wrong during a preview. And I said, okay, okay, I got it, I'll take the note. So I take the note. So we're in the production meeting at the end of the show, and Rachel says, you guys, we have got to do something about the sound of this fog machine. It is just killing this beautiful, intimate moment. And the production team was, and Rachel says, I think that we should take the entire unit, move it to a separate room, pump it through a long hose backstage, we won't hear the sound. And the production team says, yeah, that might work, but we're going to try something else first. OK. Second preview. Tiffany Tetro, heartfelt monologue. Shh. I'm like, I got it, I got it. OK, so I take the note. <laughs> production meeting, Rachel says, I really, really think we need to take the entire unit, <laughs> move it to a separate room. Production team says, yeah, yeah we're going to do something, try something else first. Third preview. Tiffany Tetro, monologue. Shh. Ah, okay, I got it. Note. Production meeting. Production team says, I think we're going to 
try and move the unit to a separate room. See if that works. Fourth preview, <laughs> Tiffany Tetro, beautiful monologue. I'm waiting. She doesn't grab my knee because there's no noise. And I look at Rachel and she looks at me and says, I don't know why no one listens to me. <laughs> and that's when I learned you should always listen to Rachel because she knows what she's doing. <laughs> Hi, I'm Valerie Mays, and my first, um, first show that I did with Rachel was when I music directed and conducted uh, John and Jen at Apple Tree. And this has to do with what happened off stage, not on stage. Um, so I was coming home from rehearsal one night, and it was pouring down rain, and I was on the expressway. I lived a completely different direction than Rachel. Um, and I got a flat tire, and I was in, you know, cars were whizzing by. It was a construction zone, typical Chicago. And I'm sitting on the side of the road, half in tears, and so I'm like, well, Rachel, Rachel will know what to do, you know? So call Rachel up, and I'm like, Rachel. I'm like, yeah, I got a flat tire, and you know, there's a car, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna call 911, and you know, I'm just kind of going on and on. She's like, Val, you're like, first of all, you're not calling 911. <laughs> and in true Rachel fashion, she like rattles off the phone number to call. They'll come, they'll, you know, they'll fix your tire, or they'll tow you or something, so fine. So I, I called the number, and of course, she's right, you know, because Rachel's usually right about those things. So I called them up, they came, they fixed my tire. Um, but they, at first, they were having a hard time getting the tire off, and I called Rachel. I don't know why I thought Rachel was going like, <laughs> to I'm like, you know, Rachel's like in Berwyn, and I'm in, you know, the city. And I'm like, well, Rachel, like, if they don't get it off, like, what am I going to do if they tow my car? And she's like, Val, you know, first breathe. And she's like, a cab. You're in the city. You know? So that's my, that's my Rachel story. But on a serious, yeah. On a serious note, um, Rachel, for me, over this past year in my um, treatment with cancer, was incredibly instrumental in paving the way and in setting an example for me on living my life despite the illness. Um, watching her walk so beautifully over the, over the past few years, you know, when she was sick, when she wasn't sick, she just kind of like lived life. And I was like, when somebody said to me, so you're going to work through chemo, I'm like, well, yeah, like Rachel worked through chemo, like I'm gonna work through chemo. And so, um, thank you, Rachel. Hi, I'm Kristen Lejeski. I'm the wardrobe supervisor here at Drury Lane. <laughs> I always look forward to the shows Rachel was going to direct with excitement and a certain amount of apprehension. <laughs> Because every show got bigger, it got more complex, and it got a lot harder. For those of you who know me, you know I have a practically PTSD response to ragtime. So thanks for that, Corey. Uh, <laughs> but she always had so much respect for our crew. She knew what we were capable of, and she always pushed us. After the third or fourth show she had directed here, I started noticing there was always one crazy quick change in the show that seemed unnecessary. <laughs> we always seem to make it on the first try somehow, but it just seemed unnecessary. So I asked her one night after a production meeting, I said, Rachel, are you putting these quick changes into the shows just to see if you can trip us up? She never actually answered me. <laughs> she just gave me a half smile with a gleam in her eye. <laughs> Hi, I'm Beth Spencer, stage manager and production manager. Okay, I do not know how you all sing and dance in these things. Give me a headset and a prompt book anytime. Mm. So the first show I ever saw in Chicago right before I moved here was Rachel's production of Ragtime here at Drury Lane, and I knew immediately I needed to work with this amazing artist. I got to meet her that night, and we knew that we were going to be great friends. And as I was getting my legs underneath me, Rachel asked if I wanted to spend some time babysitting Jake. And getting to hang out with Jake was amazing in and of itself, but it also meant getting to hang out with Rachel and Garth whenever they got home from whatever they were doing, which most of the time was rehearsal. 
Rachel and I would spend hours hanging out on their back deck, and I will forever hold on to those evenings, sitting outside, drinking beer, talking about life and theater and everything in between, or watching Criminal Minds. <laughs> While Rachel quickly became one of my dearest friends, she also welcomed me into her family, and I feel lucky and loved and oh so fortunate for that. I'm honored that she trusted me to take care of her son, and I'm lucky that I got to take care of Jake. Sometimes I think he was really taking care of me. But Rachel never did anything half-assed, so of course she had the best kid ever. <laughs> One year I got to take Jake trick-or-treating for Halloween as Rachel was unfortunately stuck in rehearsal for the evening. So I decided to dress up, dress up like Rach for Halloween. <laughs> got myself a blonde wig, thank you Erica, costume shop here at Drury Lane. <laughs> And I talked her into letting me wear that awesome plaid poncho. You know the one I'm talking about. Yeah. It was a superbly fun night. And Rach definitely got a kick out of it when she got home. Shortly after I moved here, Rach and I got to work together on our first project, Sweeney Todd, here at Drain Lane again. She was as amazing a director as I expected, and I loved being her stage manager. That woman knew how to run a rehearsal room. She created such joyous, collaborative, and creative rooms. She built families with every show she created because she drew us all together with so much love and passion. I had the honor of working on 10 productions with her while I was here, and I will forever be changed as a theater artist because of those experiences. I made a list of some things that I learned from Rachel. Number one, have fresh flowers in your house. It will bring you joy and keep you balanced. Have multiple kinds of cheese and beer in your house. You never know who's going to stop by, and you want to make sure you have something to offer them. Take the time to cook and bake and make the time to share it with the people that you love. Get a Silpat baking mat. You will use it all the time. <laughs> Challenge the status quo and dare to dream outside the box. Make the time for what matters. Don't be afraid to try something new or to take a chance on the unknown. Believe in yourself and others around you. Be fearless and lead from the heart. Never settle for good when it can be great, and never settle for great when it can be amazing and profound. I'm reading this memory from a book that we created, a huge number of us from the Chicago theater community, and this is 171 pages of photos and memories from this community for her family. We thank you for sharing her. Hi everyone, I'm William Carlos Angulo. I was one of Rachel's associates. Um, I think it's also important to add that pretty much every director choreographer in this town of my generation was at some point one of Rachel's assistants or associates. And I think that that's a huge testament to her talent and her knowledge um, and now to her legacy. So thank you, Rachel. Um, so naturally when uh, Bill and Roberta said to come up with a list of do's and don'ts for working with Rachel, I was like, got it. Um, <laughs> so uh, here are some do's and don'ts. Um, don't email her unless she emails you first. She had over 900 unread emails in her inbox the last time that I organized it for her. Um, don't take her picture, she hates that. Don't show her a picture of her even if she looks really pretty. She didn't want to live in the past. Um, don't ever take it personally. Don't assume that because she has power she's ruthless or unbreakable. She was very breakable and that was her superpower. Don't assume that you know more than her or try to have a dick measuring contest with her. She was scary brilliant, like scary brilliant, and she knew everything and was so well researched. And her dick was just bigger. Um, don't do anything to put one of her actors in harm's way. She will end you. And don't do the leading male ingenue exit. If you're a young leading male ingenue and you don't know what that is, you're probably doing it. And like, come and check with me and Spellman later, like we'll sort you out, don't worry about it. Um, do stay humble. Do leave the patriarchy at home. Do bring a grande skinny vanilla latte with you to work every morning. Seriously, it'll just make her happy and you want her happy, especially in the mornings. Um, do get to work as early as she does. This means two to four hours before a company call. She'll say you don't have to, but like do it. Um, do take comprehensive notes of everything, every version, every iteration, because she's going to ask, and you're going to need to know. Uh, video helps with this, which takes me to do deal with all of the technology in rehearsal, downloading music, recording and uploading videos, figuring out the auxiliary cord, etc. 
because she's going to take the entire session to try to figure it out herself, and she's not going to let you help her. Um, do make her do the hardest number in the show first. Otherwise, she's just going to put it off and put it off until all of a sudden it's the very last minute. You know, be like, let's just sketch it out, you know, or let's just talk through it. Or, you know, why don't you just tell me what you love about that piece, anything. Um, do pick her brain. She's lived so many lives, and those stories are wild. And she will put your entire life into perspective for you in minutes. Um, do trust her and try it her way. Even if you don't agree with her, try it her way. She brought you here for a reason. She knows what's amazing about you. She sees what's special about you. And she's just trying to put that on stage. So trust her. Katie Spellman, I was one of Rachel's associates for about eight years. Yeah, sure. Um, if you ever did a show with Rachel, you know that she always took notes in a sparkly pink notebook. If you've ever met me, you know that two of my least favorite things are the color pink and the concept of sparkle. <laughs> I worked for her for eight years and I would tease her about it on every show. Um, finally, last year, we were driving to rehearsal in Delaware and I cornered about it. I said, you are one of the best directors in the country, you are one of the leading women and the most important women in our field, and you give notes out of something that you bought at the kids section at Target. <laughs> What's the deal, Rach? She laughed, she called me a couple of names that I can't repeat at a memorial service, and then she said this, she said, when I was an actor, I was always terrified of note sessions. The directors always had these intimidating yellow legal paths. They always looked scary to me. And often the notes that came out of them were clinical or mean or rude or just bad. And I decided that when I became a director, no one would ever be scared of getting notes because notes should be a good thing and they should be a collaborative thing. So I always used a sparkly pink notebook because nothing that comes out of a glittery notebook could be scary. And it hit me really hard in that moment just how much Rachel cared about every single theater family that she created. And I was overwhelmed with respect for this incredible woman that I'd worked for for so long. And I thought to myself, that's the kind of director that I want to be. And I never made fun of her notebook again. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lillian Castillo, actor. <laughs> <laughs> Um, there are very few things that I find more, <coughs> sorry, more inspiring or galvanizing than Rachel Rockwell's first day of school speech. <laughs> you know, it's funny because whenever you see her before it, she's like, oh, I have to do the speech. And then she goes in there and in a sentence, she makes you into a family. And I have been lucky enough to be a part of many of these families that she's created. But one in particular was, well, they were all special, but the story that I have today was about one in particular. In 2015, we did our first production of Ride the Cyclone. And um, we felt so lucky to be in that room with her because we were doing this weird, unexpected, unbelievable show, and we felt like rebels, you know? Like we had a special secret that nobody knew about, and to be completely honest, I was a little afraid that nobody would get it. And, um, but in that room, I don't think I've ever laughed harder. I don't think I've ever cried and felt more deeply. I don't think I've ever felt safer to create something completely new and um, what was great about it, what, what Rachel created there was a situation where she would puppy pile with us in the, on the floor of the stage and a situation where we would all get together and plank and talk about how we needed to strengthen our cores for the rake. And, um, and she didn't need to do it, but she came and did it anyway. And um, only Rachel can give you a whole huge speech about finding this person's most authentic self and then turn around and act like a cat orgy is normal. <laughs> you know? I can't put into words how she changed my life. 
But in that room, she stretched me and worked me harder than I have ever been worked ever in my life. We achieved things in that room that we didn't think we could do. Because Rachel always said, I'm only asking for the nearly impossible. <laughs> With a smile and a glint in her eye. And then she'd turn around and say, but I believe you can do it. And I believed you when you said that. Hello, I'm David Kreppel. Uh, thank, thanks, Mom. <laughs> uh, when, when Bill and Roberta reached out uh, about stories or, or, or memories, I thought, oh, okay, what do I pick? Yes, I, I saw the birth video. Amazing. Uh, I babysat for Jake three weeks after you were born. We won't talk about the diaper change, but there's a picture of you trying to nurse on my cheek. That's good stuff. <laughs> Uh, so many meals all over the country and meals that she, she uh, uh, made, of course. Uh, but I was, I, was, I was like, okay, I'll go back to the, the earliest one, when we met. And after tonight, I'm glad that's the case because clearly it's the most influential piece of theater in the last quarter century in Chicago. <laughs> Mark Robbins, Little, <laughs> little Mermaid. <clears throat> Everybody in this room was in it, I think, at some point. Um, so yes, M Mark Kaplan was in it, and then I don't know if you got sick or hurt, th so they called me. Uh, they called the other funny short person. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, there I was. It was 94. We were all just starting out long before she uh, turned into the amazing director that we all very uh, rightly hail and, and revere. Uh, we're all just starting out goofing off, having fun, and, and, and doing good, fun Silly work, um, which leads me to the story. I don't know why we thought this was funny, but th there I was, a young David Kreppel, young Rachel Rockwell, relatively young David Jeromo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know why we thought this would be funny, but it was. Jeromo was a giant turtle with a big shell. He could duck his head in the shell. And it was, uh, I was a, a Mark Kaplan's frog, uh, pink satin shorts, I think, right? Yeah, see? <laughs> the things that you remember and scar you. Um, and what nobody has said yet about Rachel, the costume, yes, there were wings, but from head to toe, top of her head to the bottom of the point shoes, bright, yellow, shiny, spandex, that's it. Just boom, all spandex and wings. Um, and yes, on point the whole time. So David and I thought it would be funny that every time she opened her mouth, we would just become enthralled and you know, fall in love with her, and our minds would wander, and we would look, and then she would finish with the line, and we would go, huh? <laughs> and then say the next line and get on with the scene. Well, one, that would make her laugh, and two, it would make her crabby. I actually think at one point she said, as we were walking off stage, I got eyes, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but from the get, it was, it was always fun. It was always great work. Uh, and so many of these stories are, are, are from the first time that we all met and worked with her. And who's lucky enough to share 25 years of experiences like that? Uh, I got a message from a friend who knew I was coming here tonight. <laughs> and he said, the best we can hope for in life is to leave a legacy <sighs> and be surrounded by remarkable people on the journey of our lives. This is a good room and we're here because of her. Thank you. There will be an archival of The Little Mermaid in the <laughs> lobby. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Rich. <laughs> Sorry. In 2013, Rachel and I worked at uh, the Goodman Theater working on a revival of Brigadoon. During rehearsals, we would listen to Jenny Sophia sing from this day on. And Rachel would always lean over to me and she, she would say, Roberta, Jenny's voice is the first voice I want to hear every morning. The thing you don't know um, is that this show, uh, or this song from this day on, was originally Tommy's song. But Rachel said, oh, no, 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 
this is Fiona's song. She's brave and she's joyful and she needs to sing the song. So um, we have Jenny Sophia singing the song for you now. Rachel's favorite. Hard times will always reveal true friends. Returning to the stage at Drury Lane for the first time since 1986, where he made his Drury Lane debut as Zebulon and the Baker in Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat, please welcome friend, collaborator, and champion of Rachel, Kevin McCollum. so he would knew where to cut. 
The good news is, not good for Kyle, we are now in meal penalty. <laughs> We're gonna bring in some salad and chicken will be over here. Turkey will be over here and of course ham will be wherever uh, Mark Kaplan is. And he just... <laughs> I, uh, I really, uh, I really am, uh, I'm honored to speak about Rachel. I also just want to, um, to just acknowledge, we've talked a lot about Rachel's accomplishments, but the first thing we all knew about Rachel is that she was not just her resume. Her currency wasn't what she did. Her currency was how she loved. And it's why she found the music theater world, which is the most intrinsic, collaborative world, and it always came from her heart. Although, after listening to Gary, and Gary, we would have cut some of that if we had some rehearsal, um, <laughs> is that, and, and there will be lawsuits, um, is, that, is that she she was a force of nature, and we've said that, and I, and I kind of think going from the Heidi Rockwell um, uh, Helms, and you know, she did Helm three shows for me, but that, that, that sort of Heidi Rockwell Helms track, you know, Garth, she loved you like no other, but it's also fortunate she never met someone named Harry Juggernaut, because um, that might have just cut right in there uh, to, uh, to definitely realize her destiny, because she actually created her reality. And creating that reality, when I met her in 2012, and we did a revival of Brigadoon, we did a New York, we did the uh, Ride the Cyclone and also took her to New York as the director choreographer. And we also did the world premiere of Diary of Wimpy Kid. She constantly was inventive. She was psychic. You know, you would try to give her a note. She'd go, oh, I'm really open for notes. And you'd say, you know, there's that time where I'm hearing, oh, I know, we're going to move that to the other room. We're going to put a chord in it. We're going to put a pipe in it. She would anticipate your notes. So she was open for notes. And yet you never had to give them. So oftentimes I'd say, okay, so when do we open? I'll just come back. Um, <laughs> she always seeked the opportunity to put herself in interesting rooms and create opportunities not just for her, but for everyone else. The interesting room was a room where she could make connections and create families, not just in the show, but personally. And the Peggy Sue stories and all the stories we've heard are just a complete manifestation of what she was born to do. Uh, when she came out, she wasn't born. She was. She was. She. She happened. She happened, and she could do so much with so little time. And that, that is sort of why I can kind of, you know, we are here to celebrate her. But just think of how much she did with so little time. Um, Jake, I, I want to speak to you. I, I, it's, you know, there's a big bright light, which reminds me of your mom in my face. So I'm going to speak. Thank you, Jake. <laughs> the kid knows how to take a cue. Um, Jake, I just want to say to you, um, and, 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 and uh, as was alluded to before, I was your age when my mother died at the age of 40 from breast cancer. And I was an only child that I moved to Deerfield. That's what brought me to Deerfield. And I remember my mom's memorial at the uh, Honolulu uh, Community Theater, which is now Diamond Head Theater, about to celebrate 100 years, and I was a theater kid. And I just want to say to you that you have a secret weapon. And I'm, do I'm doing it in front of everybody because it is a secret weapon that we all intellectualize as adults, but you understand. And it's important to remind the adults in the room and also hopefully give you some comfort that, that I, I was there with you in, in my life. And the secret weapon is this. You understand that life is unfair. You understand adults are kids who just pay bills. You understand, you know, there's so little time, even though I'm 13 or 14, and I learned through my mother's illness of four years, the same length of your mother uh, with her illness, that don't take anything for granted, that 
The clock is ticking, not to drive yourself crazy, but to contribute, to make a difference while you're here, because the only thing we have, and the only currency we have, is love. And you are surrounded by everyone in this room who loves you, not just your family. And at the age of 40 and 45, I've talked to people who knew my mother, and it helps me keep her alive. So it helps me figure out the choices. So your secret weapon is most 14-year-olds, 13, 14-year-olds don't know how valuable time is. So now you know. I stumbled across this, uh, this poem, and uh, I really don't know why it spoke to me, but soon after Rachel's death, and I would talk to her in the hospital uh, in Seattle, and she would say things like, or they're gonna put a new port in, they're gonna do this, and I think by three o'clock I can be at rehearsal. <laughs> and I said, great. And I talked to Gary and Garth, and of course, you know, there was more to it than that. But she was always wanting to be there. And she was always figuring out plan C, D, E, F, G, all the way down to Z. Um, because she, she was alive every day in preparing for death. So I read this, and I just want to read it to you, because I've never heard it before. It's written by Kaman Khojari, uh, a British poet, and I think Rachel, Rachel is, um, <laughs> Rachel uh, will find these words uh, uh, describing what her transformation has been. I have drunk the night and swallowed the stars. I am dancing with abandon and singing with rapture. There is not a thing I do not love. There is not a person I have not forgiven. I feel a universe of love. Tonight, I am with old friends, and we are returning home, the moon is our witness. Well, Rachel, we shall all be keepers of your effervescent moon glow. We were so blessed to be cast as the stars in your chosen universe. You will be missed. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. In closing, we would like to thank the entire band with Carrie Dedman, the Drury Lane stage technicians, all the speakers and singers, Greg Hoffman, who created the lighting design tonight, as well as Creative Goods, who donated the t-shirts that the children's choir wore with the logo designed by Garth Helm. Our Chicago community always comes together when it matters the most. Thank you for sharing your time and extraordinary talents, Rachel. <clears throat> Rachel is a past recipient of the Chicago Tribune's Chicagoan of the Year in theater, Chicago's Magazine's Best Director, the 2017 Joe A. Calloway Award for Best Off-Broadway Choreography, and innumerable Joseph Jefferson Awards and nominations. I have a proclamation from Mayor Rahm Emanuel. It's quite lengthy, so I'll just sum it up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ram. As mayor and on behalf of the city of Chicago, I extend my deepest condolences on the loss of your beloved mother, daughter, relative, and friend, Miss Rachel Rockwell. He concludes by saying, please allow me to join with loved ones in honoring this exemplary woman and the indelible mark she left upon the city. Let us continue to find comfort in her memory. Through everyone whom her spirit touched and her work reached, Rachel Rockwell's enduring legacy will continue to touch many more. Rachel lived Chicago's values and will be remembered as a true Renaissance woman. With deepest sympathy, Rahm Emanuel, Mayor of Chicago. We'd like to leave you with the words of Rachel Rockwell. Roll the video, please. Today we are working on Solidarity. It's the big dance number with the minors and the ballet girls. Well, we've been working with the kids, all 22 of them, for about a week. Five, six, seven, going. Kind of getting them a little bit ahead on their staging and blocking before we add the adult company in. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, going. 
Working with Rachel is awesome. She has a way about her that kind of blows me away. She knows us well. She answers any questions and she really helps us. She's helped us through all like the emotional aspects of like whether it was the dancing or the singing, the background of the story and also like how we're feeling at this time. My goal is to help them be the best storytellers that they can be. These kids have incredible skills, but it is rarely asked of a young actor to access this kind of emotional depth, the rage, the the sadness, the joy. So that's the thing that we're working the most on. And we have to run it every day. It's like the Olympics. We just drill our routines every single day. <laughs> Exit one. But then we get to the moments in the dance studio where it's just pure joy and this incredible new form of expression that they've never had before. And that's really, really wonderful to watch. It's kids who love performing, who love dancing, who are so excited to be here. I think Billy expresses himself through dance. The moral of the story is doing what you love and pursuing what you love. I think that this play is very important. I mean, even in times of great struggle in a society, art is a healing and uniting force.